15, Lisa Nacrelli. A woman named Jamie Spradlin was faced with what could be described as every parent's nightmare on what began as a normal Saturday afternoon in Norwood, Ohio in June of 2023. She was planning to take her three kids to a local swimming pool when her youngest son, who was playing outside, came inside and told her that a woman needed to speak with her. Later identified as 44-year-old Lisa Nacrelli, the woman identified herself as a child protective services worker named Lisa. This shocked Jamie, who'd never had any previous interactions with the agency. According to a report Jamie later filed with the police, Nacrelli said she needed to look around the residence due to a complaint that she couldn't discuss the details of. While doing the walkthrough, Lisa proceeded to get the names of the other household members. And while she presented a legitimate-looking badge upon her entry into the home, Jamie suspected that something was off about the woman and ultimately decided to contact law enforcement. Police quickly determined that Nacrelli wasn't a CPS worker and that there was no active CPS case involving the family. Doorbell camera footage showed Nacrelli telling Jamie's son that he might need to come home with her, and the child replied that he needed to ask his mother. Jamie told Inside Edition that she and the boy's father were thankful their son knew what to do in the situation. Nacrelli was charged with several crimes including burglary and impersonating an officer. And if convicted as charged, she could face up to 12 and a half years in prison. 14. Jeremy DeWitt Jeremy DeWitt lost his opportunity to become a police officer when he was convicted of crimes that automatically disqualified him from the job position. But the Florida man didn't let this stop him from living out his dream, or at least trying to. He served his first sentence for impersonating a police officer in 2003, but he remained undeterred. His next sentence came in 2009 when he violated his parole for previous offenses. Over the years, DeWitt ran a funeral escort service. Authorities accused him of equipping the company's cars and motorcycles with flashing lights and sirens in a deliberate attempt to make them look like police vehicles. The crew allegedly avoided using their lights in jurisdictions where they were more likely to run into cops, and when they were confronted by law enforcement, they maintained that they were a volunteer group of funeral escorts. Many speculated that the entire team of so-called volunteers consisted of cop wannabes, and some even likened the group to a cult. According to prosecutors, DeWitt wore police-like gear and a uniform, carried pepper spray, and conducted traffic stops. And in one video, he could be seen speeding through traffic on a motorcycle with the lights flashing while ordering members of the public to pull over. At one point, he called a woman in a car an inappropriate name. Based on the shock look on her face, she was likely one of the many people who'd mistaken DeWitt as a real cop and dialed 911 to report a member of their department going off the rails. His YouTube channel reportedly contains a plethora of disturbing videos of him pulling over and harassing civilians, directing traffic, and otherwise asserting authority he doesn't actually have. DeWitt was arrested multiple times in 2019 for allegedly impersonating an officer. All along, he's adamantly denied these allegations, but he nevertheless cut a deal with prosecutors and received an 18-month prison sentence. He was arrested yet again in 2022, just months after his release, for allegedly violating his parole by failing to shut down his YouTube channel. But he claimed in an interview with local station WFTV that he'd lost access to his account. In early 2023, prosecutors filed over a dozen new charges, accusing DeWitt of fraudulently registering his escort cars and motorcycles as personal vehicles. He also allegedly defrauded insurance companies by inflating the damage to vehicles that were involved in accidents and submitting old photos from previous crashes with new claims. In one instance, he filed a claim stating that he was driving a vehicle when it crashed after telling law enforcement that one of his employees was behind the wheel. According to investigators, DeWitt received tens of thousands of dollars in fraudulent insurance payoffs. Records show that he's not currently in custody, so the status of the fraud case is unclear. 13. Carl Colston Jr. In July of 2023, a driver in Greenbelt, Maryland, was pulled over by a man they suspected of being a fake cop. 
later identified as 47-year-old Carl Colston Jr. The suspect allegedly pulled up behind the victim on a highway off-ramp in a black Crown Victoria, with internal lights flashing and honked the horn. When the victim waved for Colston to go around them, he reportedly pulled ahead and stopped in the roadway while displaying a badge. According to the motorist, Colston put on a tactical vest, identified himself as an officer, acted like he was calling for backup, and displayed a pistol. But the interaction came to an abrupt end when the victim said that he was calling the police and recording Colston, who allegedly got back in his vehicle and fled the scene. The real police caught up with Colston five days later and arrested him during a traffic stop for misdemeanor counts of impersonating a police officer, having a handgun on his person, and having a handgun in a vehicle. 12. William Goner For years, World War II veteran William C. Goner told harrowing stories about his time serving aboard the USS Hornet after becoming a lieutenant commander at the age of 19. He also claimed to have served as a frogman on the Navy's underwater demolition team, an elite unit that predated the modern-day SEALs, and boasted numerous medals and awards including four Purple Hearts, three Silver Stars, and a Navy Cross. Croner even claimed that the main character in the 1951 movie The Frogman was based on his actions during the war and that he served as a consultant on the film. It's true that Groner served in the US Navy during World War II, but he grossly exaggerated his rank and accomplishments. He was never a lieutenant commander, and in reality, he was discharged several ranks lower as a seaman first class. Groner also was never a member of the underwater demolition team, didn't receive any of the awards claimed, and wasn't the inspiration for the main character in the Frogmen movie. It's unclear how far Van Groner's tall tales go, but he lied long enough to fool his own family. The deception on the official record began in 2004, when he was interviewed by the Library of Congress for the Veterans History Project. Apparently, uh, no fact-checking was done whatsoever, and after getting away with his false narrative the first time, Groner took his tall tale and ran with it. His stories were vivid, and he told them so well that few thought to check his credibility. According to one tale, the famed General George Patton specifically saw Gurner out after hearing about his heroic feats, and the two met in Sicily. In another bogus narrative, Gurner claimed that he got trapped in a burning ship in the North China Sea during a UDT mission and woke up hours later on a hospital ship. But his lies were finally exposed in 2015, after ABC7 News I-Team reporter named Dan Noyes received a tip from a retired Navy SEAL, who was tipped off by a chain of other sources, including the POW Network and Guardian of Valor. Noyes and his colleagues dug into Gurner's background and quickly discovered that almost none of what he claimed was true. When confronted by Noyes with a copy of his actual military record, Gurner procured a certificate of his accomplishments that was supposedly issued by the Library of Congress. He admitted during the interview that a friend had made the certificate using a computer program, but refused to fully own up to his lies. After being exposed as a fraud on national television, Gurner finally admitted to his false stories. He put some of the blame on the Library of Congress for failing to fact-check him back in 2004, but even his son, Victor, called him out on his history of embellishing and fabricating things from his past. Victor said that it was the first time his 89-year-old father had even remotely admitted to doing something wrong, which in all fairness is better than taking no responsibility at all. 11. Jack Palmer an ordinary Wednesday night suddenly turned chaotic for a handful of people outside a cash saver store in Sandspring, Oklahoma, one night in November of 2023. According to Deputy Police Chief Todd Ensbrenner, it all began around 10.30 p.m. when a teenage employee of the store backed into a pickup truck while leaving work. As the young man looked over the vehicle he hit, a drunk man named Jack Palmer allegedly exited a nearby semi-truck, approached the teen, and got in his face, claiming he was a local sheriff's deputy. An adult bystander intervened in an attempt to get Palmer under control, leading to a fight between the two men. 
According to police, Palmer stepped away briefly and reappeared with a machete, which he used to strike the teen in the jaw and to poke the intervening bystander in the chest. The man swatted the machete away, cutting his hand in the process. Responding officers noticed the smell of alcohol on Palmer, who was accused of introducing himself to law enforcement as Deputy Jack Palmer. And when the cops asked him for ID, he allegedly claimed he didn't have it because he was still in training. Palmer was charged with assault with a deadly weapon, public intoxication, and false impersonation of a police officer. Ensbrenner told local station Fox 23 that it's unusual for someone to impersonate law enforcement, and they didn't know why Palmer was motivated to do so. He speculated that the suspect was possibly trying to gain favor or get the responding officers to listen, but said that all Palmer was really doing was acting a fool. On that note, Ensbrenner encouraged members of the public to dial 911 or ask for ID if they suspect that someone who claims to be an officer or deputy may be lying. 10. Fake Canadian Nurses In 2023, police on Vancouver Island, Canada received a complaint from a local healthcare worker who suspected a recent job applicant of supplying false documents while interviewing for a nursing position. Investigators identified the suspicious applicant as 34-year-old Shari Beltelloy, who had recently been the subject of a public warning from the British Columbia College of Nurses and Midwives. According to the college, Delay is not and has never been a registered nurse despite claiming to be one. She's known to use several pseudonyms and is suspected of using the identity of a real registered nurse named Yves Angelhart. Following the investigation by Vancouver Island authorities, Talei was charged with failing to comply with the conditions of an undertaking. According to police, she is also accused of furnishing a forged marriage certificate, name change affidavit, Canadian citizenship documents, and a medical insurance card. The investigation is reportedly ongoing and authorities have appealed to the public for any information they may have regarding the case. The allegations against Talay are reminiscent of another recent case of an accused serial imposter named Brigitte Clairoux, who's currently facing 17 charges for crimes she's accused of committing while pretending to be a nurse. According to news reports, the 51-year-old has a criminal record spanning three decades and consisting of at least 67 convictions. She is convicted of pretending to be a nurse in Ontario, Alberta, British Columbia, and Colorado, and was also accused of impersonating a school teacher in Alberta and Quebec. Many of her convictions stem from crimes she committed while employed in hospitals using her fake credentials. Claire Roux was busted most recently in August 2021, when a co-worker at an Ottawa health clinic became increasingly suspicious about her unprofessional behavior. The serial imposter was allegedly employed under the alias Melanie Smith, and authorities say she traumatized multiple patients. In one incident, Claire Roux was accused of making a patient feel so uncomfortable that they began sobbing and begged her to let someone else administer their IV medication. Speaking with CBC News, one of the nurses who worked with Claire Roux and the clinic described her as having an intimidating presence and being demanding of attention. The employee also noticed that Clairou's bedside manner lacked the typical traits that a trained nurse knows to look for in a colleague. After witnessing Clairou storm off after being confronted about her poor treatment of a patient, the employee and another co-worker filed complaints against her. Investigators quickly discovered that the woman's nursing credentials were bogus, and a series of Google searches revealed her disturbing past. But thanks to the proactive co-workers who followed their instincts, Clarou is now sitting in prison serving a seven-year sentence for past charges while waiting to face the music in court over her last batch of alleged crimes. 9. Theodore Kralovich In 2023, at least eight men showed up at the home and workplace of Danelle Phelps, who owns and manages a drive-up coffee shop in West Fargo, North Dakota. Strangers also messaged her on social media, claiming to have connected with her on Tinder. But Danelle knew this wasn't the case, and she racked her brain trying to figure out what was going on. When she couldn't come to the bottom of the situation on her own and the men kept showing up, she filed a police report. 
Donnell eventually learned that her neighbor, 36-year-old Theodore Kralovich, had allegedly impersonated her on the dating app, using both her photos and personal information. She later told the Daily Mail that a detective working the case wasn't even halfway through counting the number of men the fake profile had talked to when he reached 47. In addition to providing men with Donnell's home and work addresses, Kralovich provided them with a description of her vehicle. In order to protect herself, Donnell was forced to move and install additional security cameras at her coffee shop. Kralovich was arrested on suspicion of reckless endangerment, marking the first case of state authorities charging someone in connection with making fake dating app accounts. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to probation and community service. Speaking with the Daily Mail, Donnell wondered out loud why situations like this have to reach the point of something bad happening in order for authorities to take meaningful action. 8. Benjamin Aiden Ackerman from late 2016 to mid-2018, Benjamin Aiden Ackerman posed as a real estate agent in Los Angeles in order to gain access to at least 14 mansions, where he stole jewelry, purses, artwork, and other valuables. And oftentimes, he carried out the heist during open houses. Ackerman acted under the direction of former realtor Jason Yaselli, who allegedly intended to use the profits to pay off his credit card. Every month, Ackerman deposited between $5,500 and $20,000 into Yaselli's bank account. The pair targeted the homes of numerous celebrities, including Usher, Jason Derulo, Adam Lambert, former NFL player Sean Phillips, and more. Together, they made off with thousands of luxury items, with an estimated collective value well into the millions. A key clue to the thieves' identity came after former Vanity Fair deputy editor Punch Hutton's home was burglarized. Hutton identified foot and fingerprints that were eventually used to catch the suspects, and in January 2019, Ackerman and Yaselli were arrested and charged with residential burglary, money laundering, and identity theft. During a search of the men's property, authorities recovered dozens of purses, bracelets, and necklaces, along with social security cards and framed photos of celebrities. According to prosecutors, Ackerman signed into brokers' open houses using an alias. In some cases, he returned to the residence later on to continue stealing. Ackerman was accused of carrying out the actual burglaries, while Yaselli was apparently the mastermind behind the scheme. In 2023, Ackerman pleaded no contest to conspiracy to commit money laundering, 11 counts of first-degree residential burglary, and 25 counts of money laundering, along with an enhancement for white-collar crime. The 37-year-old was sentenced to 31 years in prison. Yaselli pleaded guilty to one count of residential burglary and two counts of money laundering with a white-collar crime enhancement. He was scheduled to be sentenced in November of 2023, but unfortunately, there have been no updates on his punishment. 7. Alessandro Zarelli In 2005, an Italian national in his early 20s named Alessandro Zarelli showed up in Great Britain claiming to be an up-and-coming soccer star and a member of the Italian Football Federation, FIGC. But he wasn't really a professional athlete, but he attempted to dupe several teams into signing him as a player, claiming he was in the UK as part of a cultural program sponsored by the FIGC. The Bangor City Football Club in Wales was the first known team to receive a letter that appeared to be from FIGC, offering Zarelli as a player. It described the midfielder as a brilliant left footer, and the stats detailed in the letter, assuming they were actually true, would have proven highly promising for the club. But after signing Zarelli on, it quickly became clear that he was far from the superstar that the letter talked him up as. Former team member Michael Berg described Zarelli's skills as comical and like a Sunday league player. He was then kicked off the team after a check with the FIGC proved that his credentials were bogus. Zarelli pulled off a similar scheme with the Lisburn Distillery Football Club in Northern Ireland and was essentially laughed off the field during his first game. Word got around about Zarelli being a suspected fraudster, and in 2006 he was set up by Sky TV's Superfakes program. He believed that he was meeting with a scout to talk about a professional playing opportunity, only to be informed that he'd been caught in his lies. 
When confronted by the host about his sketchy stories, Zarelli quickly admitted that he never played for certain teams, that he claimed to have a history with, and that his agent didn't really exist. His given reason for carrying out the scheme was simply that he always wanted to play professional soccer. Zarelli went on to play semi-professionally, despite being called out on national TV. Sadly, though, his life was cut short in 2018 at the age of 34, when he got into a fatal car accident while driving on the wrong side of the road. 6. Shelby Hewitt While employed as a social worker with the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families in 2022, 32-year-old Shelby Hewitt allegedly posed as a special needs foster child and enrolled at multiple high schools in the Boston area. According to prosecutors, Hewitt fabricated multiple aliases and dates of birth, claiming to be as young as 13 years old while pitching a narrative about being a traumatized teenager. She's accused of attending at least three schools while continuing to collect her $54,000 salary. An arrest report states that Hewitt's alleged crimes came to light after a man posing as her foster father went to a school that she'd enrolled in less than a week earlier and withdrew her, claiming that she had been bullied. School officials felt something was off, given how little time Hewitt had been a student, and requested all of her enrollment paperwork from the district. While reviewing the forms, an administrator noticed that something was not right about one of the enrollment forms. During a search of Hewitt's apartment, investigators reportedly found several forged documents indicating that she'd used other people's identities in her enrollments at other schools. But it's unclear why Hewitt allegedly posed as a student. Even the judge who presided over one of her initial court hearings in July of 2023 asked what was actually going on here, to which the prosecution responded that the case was still under investigation. Hewitt's defense lawyer argued that his client has a long history of suffering from mental illness, but that she never posed a danger to anyone and that she made some distorted decisions through unclear thinking. The attorney further stated that Hewitt had started getting mental help since her arrest. She was initially charged with seven counts, including five counts of document forgery. Then in December 2023, a grand jury indicted her on nine additional charges, including five felony forgery counts, identity fraud, larceny over $1,200, and violating public employee standards of conduct. 5. Rico Dukes there's no denying that many women are attracted to men in uniform, which is perhaps why 26-year-old Rico Dukes posed as a Bernalillo County, New Mexico sheriff's deputy on Tinder. He posted a photo of himself in what appeared to be a police uniform with a badge, gun, and handcuffs, along with another photo that showed what he claimed was his official patrol vehicle. Jukes wasn't a sheriff's deputy or a member of law enforcement, period, but he allegedly talked to people as if he was, discussing things like shift changes and patrol vehicle upgrades. In April of 2023, a Bernalillo County employee matched with Dukes on Tinder and didn't recognize him as a legitimate sheriff's deputy. Unaware that the woman was a city employee who suspected him of being a fraud, Dukes allegedly said that he'd served for one year on the Albuquerque police force, another lie, and that it was a horrible experience, prompting his transfer to the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office. A detective eventually took over the conversation, and Dukes agreed to meet the woman in person. He showed up wearing a BCSO uniform but driving a civilian vehicle, and was quickly surrounded and taken into custody by both local and federal officials. According to authorities, Dukes admitted to buying the Bernalillo County gear at a local store that sells uniforms, claiming that he planned to make a promotional video for the agency. He also bought a gun, magazines, and ammunition, and took many other steps to portray a police officer, according to state prosecutor India Trummer, who said this isn't someone who just decided to impersonate an officer for one day. Dukes spent seven months in jail pending the outcome of the case and ultimately pleaded guilty to the charge. At a sentencing hearing, his defense attorney urged the judge for leniency, stating that his client had been playing the role of good cop and doing it pretty well. The judge concluded that Dukes had impersonated a cop for the sake of picking up women and sentenced him to two and a half years of probation. 
he was ordered to wear an ankle monitor for a year, was banned from owning any patches, badges, or clothing that might imply a position of authority, and his probation officer is now monitoring his social media and dating accounts. 4. Herman Breitman Over 21 months, starting in January 2022, a 30-year-old man from the New Jersey town of West New York named Herman Breitman allegedly posed as a healthcare worker on dating apps to gain the trust of female victims, then kidnapped and assaulted them. According to federal authorities, he created profiles using the alias Nazir Griffiths and claimed to be a nurse or nurse practitioner in New York City area hospitals. He included photos of himself wearing scrubs and lab coats, made fake medical employee IDs to make his act more believable, and even created a LinkedIn page documenting phony credentials. Brightman is accused of brutalizing at least four women from an area spanning New Jersey to Mount Vernon, New York, including the Bronx and Queens. According to the victims, he became violent shortly after they started dating and was especially aggressive if they tried ending the relationship. In a statement announcing an eight-charge indictment against Brightman in December 2023, U.S. Attorney Damian Williams said that Breitman went so far as to kidnap the women at knife point and threatened to kill them. During one particularly alarming incident, the defendant allegedly forced a woman to travel with him from New York to his home in New Jersey at knife point after she broke up with him. And according to Williams, Breitman threatened to kill the woman if she made any problems and physically prevented her from leaving the entire night. Another woman accused Bryman of threatening to gut her like a fish at knife point, binding her hands and attempting to tape her mouth shut. Then, when she got away from him and ended the relationship, Bryman allegedly called her repeatedly and threatened to physically harm her. A third woman claimed that Bryman had lured a Bronx woman into his car, where he put her in a chokehold and refused to let her out of the vehicle. She escaped and called the police, but was confronted at her job just days later by the defendant, who asked her multiple times if she'd contacted law enforcement. The victim also accused Brightman of following her home from work and throwing a traffic cone at her. The fourth known attack came a month later, when Brightman allegedly persuaded a woman who'd broken up with him to let him inside her apartment. According to authorities, Brightman strangled, threatened, and assaulted the victim who managed to escape with a friend's help. He now faces eight federal charges, including kidnapping, cyberstalking, interstate travel to commit domestic violence, and more. And at least three of the counts he faces carry a prison sentence of up to 20 years if convicted. Three, Ana Hernandez. At a time when countless immigrants are pouring into the United States in hopes of pursuing a better life, there are plenty of snakes lurking with plans to take advantage of these newcomers. One of them is a 53-year-old Texas woman named Ana Hernandez, who allegedly posed as a U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services employee and offered to process immigration applications for a substantial fee. Victims provided Hernandez with the required documents, but she isn't a real USCIS employee, and she never followed through with her promises to have their immigration statuses adjusted. According to Homeland Security Investigations agents, Hernandez amassed thousands of dollars in unexplained wealth over 18 months starting in 2020, during which her fraudulent activities took place. When news of her arrest broke in early 2023, authorities believed that she had defrauded at least 20 victims of more than $400,000, which was paid to Hernandez in cash, money orders, and bank transfers. Following Hernandez's arrest, investigators were flooded with phone calls from dozens of people claiming to be victims. While the extent of her crimes remains unclear, she's been convicted of 10 counts of wire fraud and one count of impersonating a United States employee. She could have faced up to 20 years in prison, but instead she received a seven-year sentence. Hernandez was also ordered to pay more than $123,000 in restitution, along with a nearly $20,000 money judgment order. 2. Brandon Knapp In November of 2023, police in Suffolk County, New York, accused 27-year-old Brandon Knapp of luring a 28-year-old woman into his vehicle while pretending to be an FBI agent. According to authorities, Knapp reached out to the woman in response to something she posted on social media. 
The victim invited Nab to meet her at a relative's residence in the Long Island hamlet of Comac, where he allegedly persuaded her to join him on a ride to an FBI safe house. They left their home together, prompting a concerned family member to contact the woman. Based on the conversation, the relative believed that the woman was in danger and called the police, who thankfully were able to track her cell phone location. Southampton Town Police then located the victim at a restaurant where she'd been dropped off. It's unclear what happened during the time the victim and Knapp were together, but the investigation led to charges against Knapp for unlawful imprisonment and criminal impersonation. He denied the charges to the press through his attorney, but the case appears to still be developing, and detectives have urged anyone else who might have been a victim to contact them as the investigation continues to unfold. And now for number one. But if you want to hear even more stories, stay tuned for some extra content that you might have missed. 1. Alexander Dubois Jr. The next item on today's list serves as a reminder that impersonation and con artistry are age-old crimes that have been around for a lot longer than many of us probably realize. In April 1926, the California-based Healdsburg Tribune published the photo of a man calling himself Jerry Tarbot, who claimed to be a military veteran and an amnesia victim of World War I. The article stated that the federal government had been trying to figure out Tarbot's real name for three years, and that Tarbot himself wanted to know his real identity for the sake of being able to prove his wartime service and collect veterans' benefits. Nicknamed the Sliding Ghost, he was known to the Veterans Bureau for his alleged ability to stealthily maneuver his way through the most dangerous parts of no man's land on the battlefield. Tarbot supposedly lost his memory eight years prior to the article's publishing, when he was injured by an exploding shell. He then turned up in Stockton, California in 1923, claiming that he didn't know who he was or how he got there. According to the article, Tarbot believed he grew up in New York and served in France during the war. He claimed that dozens of people had falsely tried claiming him as a long-lost relative, but the truth was that he was the real fraudster. Just a year after the article seeking to identify Tarbot was published, investigators met the request, although not in the way he likely hoped. They identified the young man as Alexander Dubois Jr., a known draft dodger and car thief who also had a habit of abandoning his wives. He had more than 20 aliases in the states of Pennsylvania and Michigan alone and was reportedly living as a career criminal in California during the time he later claimed he was serving in the military. Dubois had been married at least twice and had worked numerous jobs before he was arrested in San Francisco for stealing cars in 1922. He was declared insane and put in an asylum where his amnesiac war veteran story was born. And despite eventually being called out for his lies, he published two editions of a story about the so-called unknown war veteran Jerry Tarbert. Number 9. Nikki Yovino Two Sacred Heart University football players had their lives flipped upside down back in 2016 when they were accused of committing an assault against a young woman during a campus party in Fairfield, Connecticut. Both men were later suspended from their team and lost scholarships based on the allegations. Their accuser, 18-year-old Nikki Yavino, allegedly told investigators the men had pulled her into a room and held her down. They then supposedly took turns attacking her. She said that she told them she didn't want anything to do with them and that she begged the men to let her go. But several witnesses reportedly told police that it seemed like Yovino willingly went into the room with the athletes. When questioned about this, she took back her story and admitted making the story up in a bid to gain sympathy from a different man she wanted to date. After this case went to trial, Ivino pled guilty to charges of second-degree false reporting and interfering with police. She served one year in prison, followed by two years of probation thanks to her lies, and was denied an early end to her punishment. Number 8. Emery Ellis A homeless man from Boston named Emery Ellis didn't expect to get arrested when he went to buy some breakfast from Burger King one morning in 2015. But staff members accused him of trying to pay for his food with a counterfeit $10 bill, so the police got involved. 
Ellis sat behind bars for three months on simple allegations of forging a banknote and violating probation, until the Secret Service actually determined the bill was real. Prosecutors dropped the forgery charge and later released Ellis, but the incident left long-lasting emotional scars. Ellis sued Burger King in 2018 for discriminating against him based on his appearance. He claims they treated him unfairly since he was a homeless black man. Speaking with the Associated Press, his attorney, who happened to be white, Justin Drexler, said, A person like me would have gotten an apology, but a person like Emery somehow finds his way in handcuffs for trying to pay for his breakfast with real money. Burger King responded to Business Insider's request for comment by saying the company couldn't comment on ongoing litigation, but that they don't tolerate discrimination of any kind in their restaurants. The outcome of the lawsuit remains unclear. Number 7. Misreported Facts in 2022, the Macon County Sheriff's Office in Georgia received an email claiming that the agency used a photo of a man wearing a turban and holding an automatic rifle during an active shooter drill. The accusation-filled letter to Sheriff Robert Holland came from the Council on American Islamic Relations CAIR, the largest Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization in the U.S. Vice News picked up the story after CAIR published the full letter, prompting dozens of other advocacy groups, outlets, and social media users to pass the story on from there, leaving the sheriff's image irreparably tarnished. And if the department had actually done what it was accused of, the damage would have been fair. But that wasn't actually the case. Sheriff Holland and his department received concerning threats regarding this alleged discrimination. Holland successfully rebuked the rumor by pointing out how the sheriff's office had never held an active shooter drill at the local school where the footage was filmed. While clearing one's name in a world full of people who believe what they want is far from easy, CAIR apologized for the mistake, which helped to put the wildly false allegations to rest. The Southern Scoop newspaper also caught on to and was quick to clear things up between what the sheriff was being accused of and the actual facts. In the meantime, a CAIR spokesperson said the organization is still determined to find out which agency did use the stereotypical active shooter target. The representative also criticized Holland for failing to respond to CAIR's initial letter concerning the incident or to the Vice News article that reported about it. Number 6. John Harden in 2014, a Heritage Creek, Kentucky man named John Harden tried to buy some alcohol at a convenience store and was denied by the cashier, who believed he was already too drunk. Harden returned to the store later to buy a bag of potato chips, and an officer working security at the time allegedly lifted him up off the ground and slammed him into the floor. Harden sued the officer named Keith Hillman for false arrest and imprisonment. He accused Hillman of using excessive force, arresting him without enough cause, and maliciously prosecuting him. The court sided with Harden regarding the arrest without probable cause, but dismissed his claim of excessive force being used. A jury ultimately ruled in Officer Hillman's favor. Harden continued to pursue the case, though, which eventually made its way to the Federal Court of Appeals. In the meantime, a black juror from a previous trial raised concerns about possible racial bias from her white peers, who allegedly called Harden a crackhead and maliciously referred to his legal team as the Cosby family. She believed the jury's preconceived notions about Harden had stopped him from getting a fair trial. The former juror also said the other jurors accused Harden of drinking or using drugs during trial breaks in order to make himself seem calm in court. When she reminded them that their job was to focus on whether or not Hillman used excessive force, they apparently responded by accusing Harden of wanting some free money. The Sixth Circuit Court determined the jury's belief that Harden was on drugs constituted overt racial bias. This case is one among many more that highlight the ongoing problem of racial bias among jurors and calls into question whether a jury can truly be impartial in court cases. Number 5. Rebecca Whitehurst 
In 2019, Rebecca Whitehurst was working as a school teacher one day in Manchester, England, when she noticed a visibly upset student. She reached out to the boy and invited him to a mindfulness session in hopes of helping him get set on a better path. But the 40-something-year-old teacher's good deed was met with horrifying allegations that she abused the student, who was less than half her age. The boy claimed that Whitehurst committed unspeakable acts of misconduct, both in her car and online through WhatsApp. Soon enough, she found herself facing multiple charges in connection to the alleged abuse. Prosecutors argued that Whitehurst had become involved with the student unlawfully. In the meantime, the disgraced educator's defense lawyers claimed that, while Whitehurst could have handled the situation in a more professional way, the student wasn't a victim at all and was the real abuser. They accused him of targeting Whitehurst with threats and manipulation and of faking an inappropriate WhatsApp conversation that he submitted to law enforcement as evidence to use in court against the teacher. Whitehurst testified that the teen had initiated contact with her through Snapchat and had claimed he was in love with her. She said she made it clear to him that his behavior was beyond unacceptable, but despite the effort, he continued to approach her when she was alone in the classroom and even made physical advances towards her. When she turned him down, he allegedly spat in her face and slapped her. Describing herself as gullible, Whitehurst said she felt stupid for giving her contact information to a student and that her humiliation over the situation stopped her from reporting his behavior. At one point, she even told the boy she was going to the hospital and wouldn't have her phone in an attempt to stop him from trying to speak with her. She also told him she wanted no further contact, but claimed the boy continued to pursue her relentlessly. In a move that shocked prosecutors, a jury believed Whitehurst's version of events and acquitted her of all supposed charges. Number 4. Michael Shannon One evening back in 2004, someone approached a group of three men on a New Orleans sidewalk and fatally shot 46-year-old Ralph Core Jr. before getting into a vehicle and driving away. Seven witnesses described the shooter as a black man that stood about 6 feet 1.8 meters tall, but most of them failed to get a close enough look to accurately identify him. In the meantime, detectives believed that the murder stemmed from an ongoing feud between the victim's brother, Darren Cole, and another man named Wayne Palmer. An informant claimed that Palmer's cousin, Michael Shannon, was the supposed shooter and that he wanted to kill Darren but mistook Ralph as his brother and mistakenly shot him instead. Two of the witnesses were shown a photographic lineup containing Shannon's photo. Emma Burgoyne, who was stopped at a traffic light nearby when the shooting happened, identified Shannon as the main culprit. The other witness who looked at the lineup identified different suspects. Based on Burgoyne's singular testimony, Shannon was convicted of second degree murder even though he was only 5 feet 6 inches, 1.7 meters tall, and didn't match the description of the shooter at all. His trial lasted just five hours. Two jurors questioned Burgoyne's credibility and voted to acquit Shannon based on the apparent lack of evidence. But in Louisiana at the time, 10 guilty votes were enough to convict someone. After deliberating for 30 minutes, the jury returned with a verdict. Shannon maintained his innocence throughout and won a new trial in 2017. But before it could happen, the district attorney dropped the charges against him and said in a statement that Shannon was likely not the one responsible for Cole's murder. He was freed from prison and received a $113,000 settlement from the state after spending more than 12 years behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. Number 3. Amy Salerno when a Franklin County, Ohio jury found a defendant not guilty of a misdemeanor assault, they were reprimanded by Judge Amy Salerno, who had a reputation for being incredibly harsh. She allegedly verbally berated the jurors in court and accused them of coming to the wrong conclusion about the case, leaving them embarrassed and upset. Salerno's ruthlessness caught the attention of her colleagues. So she publicly apologized for her behavior after a court determined that she subjected the entire Ohio judicial system 
to widespread criticism and ridicule. The disgraced judge made headlines yet again a few years later in 2019 when the Ohio Supreme Court found her guilty of judicial misconduct for a second time. Her license to practice law was then suspended for a year, and she was ordered to undergo more ethics training. If she failed to do so or committed more misconduct, she risked losing her law license permanently. Salerno admitted to some of her wrongdoings, including secretly negotiating with the defendant's attorney to lower their bail from $350,000 down to $85,000 without consulting the case's prosecutor. She was also accused of regularly losing her temper and acting out in anger. But there's always more than one side to a story. Over 30 people, including lawyers and another judge, wrote to the court testifying that Salerno had good character. Regardless of what the truth may really be, her decision to accuse a jury of reaching an inaccurate verdict seems to have been the unraveling point in her judicial career. Number 2. Ricky Martin Puerto Rican singer Ricky Martin rose to fame in the US during the late 90s with his viral hit single Livin La Vida Loca. He made headlines for incredibly different reasons in recent years though when his nephew Dennis Yadiel Sanchez Martin accused him of committing horrific acts of abuse. Martin's reputation suffered during the controversial case. He adamantly maintained his innocence and his accuser eventually took back their claims. But it wasn't enough to restore the singer's name, and he was left picking up the pieces of his career even after he was technically cleared of all wrongdoing. In an attempt to make it abundantly clear that he was falsely accused and to recover some of his losses, Martin filed a lawsuit against his nephew in civil court earlier this year. The lawsuit accuses Sanchez Martin of persecuting, besieging, harassing, stalking, and extorting Martin for his own financial gain. Martin also claimed that his nephew stepped up his campaign of destroying the singer's reputation whenever his bids to get money failed. Additionally, the lawsuit says that Sanchez Martin even admitted under oath that Ricky never assaulted him. Martin claims he's lost tens of millions of dollars over the situation and is hoping to recover at least a portion of his assets through the case. Number 1. Caroline Lee a Florida school teacher named Caroline Lee had recently been named the Teacher of the Year at the Darnell Cookman School District in Jacksonville when an 8th grade student accused her of hitting them in 2021. The 60-year-old educator was then charged with child abuse and was released without bail but still lost her job in the process. In the meantime, concerned parents got a letter from the district reassuring them Lee had been removed from the classroom and wouldn't be back while her case was being conducted. Footage from the alleged incident showed Lee walking behind a student with what prosecutors described as an aggressive pace. The video later showed the pair leaving the classroom at about the same time with the student holding their hand up to their face as if they were hurt. The alleged victim claimed Lee had called them an inappropriate name and struck them multiple times in the head. Nearly a year later, the state attorney's office dropped the charges against Lee based on a lack of evidence. After having her life turned upside down by the harsh allegations, the former teacher has called for increased protections for educators against false accusations of abuse. While some believe a lack of evidence doesn't necessarily mean Lee is completely innocent, she maintains that she did not hit a student and said the experience has left her traumatized. Would you be more upset to learn that your partner had pretended to go to work every day for weeks after losing their job, or that they'd borrowed money to pay their portion of the bills while pretending not to be broke? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.